is brought to you by Local Video Marketing. In association with CoachChick.com There. This is Kim Lucart, and welcome to another episode of Eat, Skate, Win. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you a favorite hockey strong snack of many of the youth ice hockey players that I work with. But before we dive into this favorite snack, I want you to remember that timing makes a difference. The closer your skater gets to ice time, the less fat, fiber, and protein you want to offer them in their snack. Too much fat will slow them down. Too much fiber will cause stomach cramps, and too much protein will take longer for the stomach to digest, leaving food in their stomach when their practice begins or their game begins. Chobani flip cups are a favorite of the young skaters that I work with. Chobani flip cups contain about 200 calories or less per serving and round about 10 grams of protein. Now the amount is gonna vary depending on the ingredients. These make a great quick snack for a youth ice hockey player, providing a little bit of protein and some needed calories. However, if your skater has food allergies, please take time to read the food label. There are 21 different flavors of Chobani Flip Cups. These two Chobani Flip Cups, I recommend in the two hours before ice time, they are the lowest in fat that I've found. So the Coffee Brownie Bliss is about 20% fat and the Salted Caramel Crunch is 20% fat and it is the lowest in added sugars. And then we have some others that are good for a snack throughout the day, say a mid-morning snack, the s'mores, cookie dough, mint chocolate, cookies and cream, and cinnamon bun fun all range between 23 and 24% fat. And then we have some Chobani flip cups that are a little bit fuller in fat, which make another good snack 
or another good addition to a school lunch to round out some needed calories and add a little bit more protein and calcium for your growing athlete. The peanut butter blast, 27% fat, banana cream at 28% fat, and any of the flavors with peanut butter are gonna come in between 28 and 30% fat. If you'd like to learn more about Youth Ice Hockey Nutrition, come on over to Facebook and join my private group, Youth Ice Hockey Nutrition Solutions for Busy Hockey Parents. Remember, what you put on your plate determines how you will skate. This is Kim Lucard, Hockey Mom RD. Happy skating till next time. Make no mistake about it. Our sport is all about motion. And I found that I can unbelievably improve a player's skating, the rhythm, their power, and their efficiency with these exclusive off-ice methods. I can also help older players with their explosive strength, toughness, and conditioning. This morning, Dave Smith's Resistance Band Training.com coming to you from the weight room today. To talk to you about dangle training. Yeah, it's a it's a technique that I've been using a great deal, especially as I get older, to go ahead and be able to keep some weight training in my workouts. Let me take you through the concept of the setup first of all, and how to go ahead and utilize it. Then we'll talk about the benefits. All right, first of all, the setup. You'll see me use dangle training in a lot of different ways. You'll see me use it with dumbbells. You'll see me use it with barbells, kettlebells. All right, so, and you'll see me use it where I just lift a simple weight plate. Regardless of how you want to use it, here's how you want to go ahead and set it up. You always want to go ahead and on a barbell, for instance, you want to use a bigger band. I like using the extra large green band because it creates just enough effect of the bouncing without going ahead and getting it moving too much. You got to remember, this weight's going to oscillate, it's going to swing. You're gonna don't want to hit the bar or the rack to throw you off balance, so you want to go a little bit slower with that. I like using rubberized plates if possible, so there's just not as much clanging of the weight. Or if again, if the metal weight hits the bar, it just doesn't make as much noise. But here, regardless, you can use metal plates with it as well. I like to go ahead when I'm setting it up on the barbell and put it out as long as far as I can on the barbell to increase the lever arm. Increasing the lever arm is going to increase the stability factor that I'm going to need to work on and create, increase the results of the training that I'm trying to do with dangle training. Also, in regards to how much weight to put on hanging down, that's gonna be dependent on your strength level. Here's a general guideline. Whatever weight I put on the bar or on the bands, I wanna go ahead and be able to do that weight at least eight to 10 reps. Because then what I'll do is if I wanna go heavier, I'll just add weight onto the end of the bar here to go ahead and make up the effect. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the setup. Now, how far, and the, also, the other thing about this is you wanna make sure that you keep the weight far enough away from the rack so that it doesn't hit the rack. So that's another reason why I'll extend the weight out pretty far on the barbell. So why am I gonna go ahead and do dangle training? Well, there's a few reasons that are pretty important. Number one, dangle training is gonna create more of a stabilization effect. Therefore, as a result, it's going to increase more core stability activation. I'm going to have to go ahead and I'm really going to have to engage my trunk, especially when I get the bar over my head or I get the bar lengthened away from my, my, my center of gravity. So in this case, as I'm going ahead and pushing overhead, once I get the bar overhead, this is going to have to be extremely activated and engaged to be able to keep the weight overhead. Secondly, it's going to help me improve peripheral stability. Well, that makes sense because if my trunk is more activated, then the primary joints that are being challenged are also going to be more stabilized, which then that means in the push press case, my rotator cuff is going to have to go ahead and have some great support from my trunk and my scapula to help it stay, keep that glenohumeral joint, that shoulder joint stable. That's an example of 
keeping better peripheral stabilization. So better trunk activation, better peripheral stabilization. Secondly, I don't have to load the bar as much. Yeah, I can load the bar with less weight, so as a result of it, it's much more joint friendly, much more age friendly. And it's one of the reasons that I like doing it because I don't have to load up the bar with as much weight, but I still can get the same effects I'm looking for that I would use, used to get when I was younger from lifting weights. So that's the third reason. Another reason, it's gonna increase muscle recruitment. Yeah, you're gonna see a huge increase in muscle recruitment of the primary muscles, which once again, is a great thing because you can get the same effect, the same muscle recruitment, without having to go ahead and put a big load on the bar. Lastly, it allows me to keep weight training in my program. You know, if I didn't do dangle training, or if I didn't do band acceleration training, which is another, another for another video, I'm gonna go ahead and find that weight training in itself doesn't give me the same effect. Number one, I can't load up the bar with as much weight as I used to because my joints won't tolerate it. So as a result, I can't get the muscle recruitment and I can't get the effect that I'm used to getting from weight free weights. It's one of the reasons I like bands because I can go ahead and get much more of a muscle contraction with bands than I can with weights. However, when I go to dangle training or when I go to acceleration training with the band, I go ahead and get the same muscle recruitment and therefore I can get great workouts lifting weights without beating up my body. So there's a few reasons why I like dangle training. Uh, it just allows me to go ahead and have a great time with free weights, something that I don't do often, but you'll see me lifting uh, frequently. Lastly, I know what you're saying. Well, Dave, why, why do I need bands to do this? Why can't I go ahead and just use a strap? Well, you can, but with bands, it's gonna create an elastic effect, a increase a bouncing effect, which is gonna increase the effect of dangle training. That's why you're gonna use bands. All right. The other thing is it grips the bar, it allows you to grip the band, it creates a better way of going ahead and just allowing you to train using the band versus with a strap. So that's another reason I like to go ahead and use bands. That said, that's Daniel Train, guys. Go ahead and give it a try, especially if you're an older, over 40 kind of guy and you're looking for a different way to train with weights because regular free weight training is beating up your body. Give some Daniel Training a try and see what you think. All right. Have a good day, guys. And I'll be back with you with some more 101 fan training. What you're watching here is one of my skills clinics. And I actually put through different skills clinics that took place uh, probably around the year 2000. And as I joke every once in a while, uh, it was often like the scene of the crime. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you about tonight has to do with the dad and the son a long time student of mine, really nice people, nice family. But I was really bothered on a given night when the boy kept on leaving the ice. He was a skilled player, he was a hard worker, and all of a sudden he was trying to get away from the ice. The dad ultimately explained to me that the boy had been experiencing some back problems the last couple of times he skated. And this was the first time he was with me and had that uh, that day. You know, I had to be responsible for the ice, so it was one of those things where I'd run over and, and talk to the dad at the sideboards for a minute, uh, let the boy know that I cared about him, and uh, then run back to supervising my, my clinic. But uh, as we went back and forth, I, I tried to quiz the dad on things like... Uh, you know, did he did he have a collision during a recent game? No, he hadn't. Um, 
did he have any new equipment, uh, like a new stick? Or, you know, and the dad initially said no. I, I said, how about the skates? And he said, well, I did buy him a pair of used skates. And that's what he's wearing now. And I said, the problem has come since he's been wearing those used skates. And the dad said, I think so. What I told the dad to do was get those skates off fast and bring them down to the uh, pro shop that is down in the corner of the rink. And I said, ask the guy to check for a certain thing. He came back probably about 15 minutes later. And here you go. Um, I recommend something uh, I, I refer to as a neutral radius or a zero radius on the skate. And, uh, um, the skate radius for a hockey skate is generally uh, an, like it's cut out of a nine foot circle. And that can be adjusted and stuff at advanced levels, but basically we're talking about a nine foot radius circle. And that's where the term radius comes from. And again, I usually recommend that the player have the radius done. Um, so the balance point is in the middle of the blade, and that's what many of us would refer to as a zero or neutral. What the guy in the pro shop had discovered and told the dad was that the previous owner of the skates quite evidently was a defenseman, and he thought that it would help if he had his skate radius changed slightly, uh, and have it make him lean backwards so that supposedly it was going to help him skate backwards better. Anyway, I told the dad, listen, it'll cost you a few dollars. And, and I mean, back then it was under $10, I think, to have a zero radius put back on, on the skate. Um, I don't think it was instant, but uh, it, it did cure the problem from when the kid was back to skating normally after that. Um, where did the back pain come from? Normally the kid was used to be at balancing and having his posture be balanced over that midpoint on the blade. All of a sudden, the blades were pushing him to lean backwards, but he was trying to bend himself back into his normal skating posture. And if you can picture that, all the stress is going to be on the back. So that's where the back uh, pain came from. You know, now, now a lot of people are familiar with the radius. Um, anyone who wasn't before, you now know the significance of the radius. Um, nowadays, actually, people buy a lot of their hockey equipment online. Uh, anyway, you get those get those boxes uh, coming by UPS or whatever. Um, you open the box, and I think you know enough that a new pair of skates needs need to be sharpened. So you're going to go to the pro shop for that. What most people don't realize is that probably as much as the skate manufacturers would like. The skates don't come out in perfect nine foot radius. So I recommend the, the first things you do, again, you open that box, you know you're going to bring those skates to the local pro shop. Um, but be, before you get the sharpening, I would have the radius checked, make sure it's true. And then let me mention one last thing before I, I leave this topic. Uh, I'm going to tell you along the way that I've been around the game for a lot of years. Um, and one of the benefits is going through trial and error. Um, it's all of that experience, the trial and error, um, that go into me being able to help uh, you, perhaps. 
All right, so that's it for now. And I hope to catch you uh, in the next video within a couple of days. Thanks so much for being with me. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to skate normal. <laughs> we're going to skate with the wide, typical wide stance, and we're going to see how fast we are and see what the difference is. Okay, guys, as fast as you can, one hand in your stick. Now just skate like you normally do, okay? Okay, we'll see what my time is. 4.75. So that's a little faster. Now let's watch Chris. See the difference in his skates? See how much more powerful he looks? 4.65. But the, the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you see how much power, more powerful it looks when they're skating. Now doesn't that look more powerful with Nolan skating? And Nolan, Nolan was the fastest, 4.42. As I said, it's not, you know, it's not, it probably wouldn't pass the, the rigorous standards for the research that we usually do, but it gives you a pretty objective evidence that, that that wider stride is a much faster way of skating than bringing your skates in, bringing your skates in. Now, let's have all of us skate in a normal way, the way a lead or fast skater skate, actually the way that all three of us skate with our arm movement, so now guys just skate normal, okay? And we'll see if we're faster. We'll see if we're faster, okay? Okay, we'll see how I did. See if I was faster. 4.79, and now Chris is gonna go, and we can just see what Chris is gonna do here. That's it, Chris, good work, man. Side to side. 4.73 and we'll see what Nolan does here and we'll see if Nolan is faster he certainly looks faster doesn't he ladies and gentlemen 4.65 when the arms move side to side it was faster by 0.16 to 0.33 seconds so 0.16 to more than a quarter of a second 
more than a quarter of a second. A quarter of a second is the time between when you get the puck and you don't get the puck because you're not fast enough. It's the time where you score a goal and you don't score a goal because you're not fast enough. This has been a local video marketing production. We hope you've enjoyed this, and that you've picked up a number of great hockey tips. Please do tell some friends about these shows, and let the contributing coaches know how much you appreciate them.